Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Asiri, and our mission is to support the military community in their civilian career. Today's episode number 348, The Gift of Struggle with Bobby Herrera. And I remember stepping off the bus that night, and I'm 17. I can't see three feet in front of my face. I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. All I knew is that I wanted my future to look much different than my past. Outside of knowing that, hey, I think I want to raise my hand and join the Army a year later, I was clueless. But after that moment, I knew why. Like I would somehow, some way, figure out a way to create something that would allow me to pay forward that kind act to other kids like me who were born on the wrong side of the opportunity divide. Mm. And that act of kindness, you know, it's packed with lessons, but from an entrepreneurial perspective, that's where it started for me. It's like that became the invisible force that drove me. And I had no idea what it was going to be, but I knew that nothing could stop me. And I was going to figure out a way to create something that would eventually become my vehicle to do just that. The top two reasons to listen to today's episode are mindset. Bobby's book, The Gift of Struggle, shares stories of adversity he has faced in his personal and professional life and how each of those struggles was a gift to him, his family, and his team. There is a great lesson for every listener in this. Two, leadership. Bobby built his team to over 300 employees with nearly 9,000 contractors worldwide. He is humble and direct in sharing the mistakes he has made along the way to this incredible feat. If you enjoy today's episode, be sure to check out episode 328, Struggle is What Gives Us Value with Micah Fink and Heroes and Horses, and episode number 99, Jacob Martinez, Army Sergeant to President of USA's 592nd Fastest Growing Company. Beyond the Uniform has over 350 podcast episodes and 20 videos with America's top veterans, including Jocko Willink, the former CEO of Pepsi, NFL players, and more. They are all offered for free at beyondtheuniform.org. If you benefit from Beyond the Uniform and would like to help us get this in front of more members of the military community, please consider donating at beyondtheuniform.org. You can also text support BTU to 33777, and we will send you additional information. Our cost of production is $300 per month. We are an all-volunteer team, and we could greatly use your financial support. That is at beyondtheuniform.org slash donate, or by texting support BTU to 33777. So with that, let's dive into my conversation with Bobby. Well, joining me today in Portland, Oregon, my guest is Bobby Herrera. Bobby, welcome to Beyond the Uniform. A healthy underdog. (laughs) Uh, So excited to have Bobby on the show. It's been a long time in in the works. And for listeners, I'll put a link to his book, The Gift of Struggle. Read that a couple months ago, loved it. Connected with Bobby for a call. And just I'm sure that you will fall in love with Bobby and his, his attitude on both life and business. Uh, for some quick background, he's the, gift, he's the author of The Gift of Struggle, a book about leadership and the life-changing lessons we learn through our struggles. For those of you who have read Extreme Ownership or the Dichotomy of Leadership, it's a similar approach, which is um, Bobby shares a real-life story. He then uh, explains a principle behind that and an application that he's seen in his business life. So it's a, a, a nice book for those of you who are coupling leadership with business. Um, he's also the co-founder and president of the Populous Group, which is a staffing and recruiting company. They have over 300 internal employees, over 9,000 uh, external contractors. So a pretty massive scaled organization. Uh, he founded the Populous Group nearly 18 years ago. Prior to that, did some other work that we may talk about and was an, uh, arm in the Army as a field artillery uh, person for over seven years. He has a str- uh, passion for building strong cultures and communities through trust and storytelling and um, really excited to have you on the show, Bobby. Thanks, Justin. Very kind words. I appreciate it. And maybe to start things off, anything that's not in that bio that you want listeners to know? Uh, you know, I think probably the real stuff, the more important stuff is on the back of the resume. You know, it, uh, I'm an organizational nightmare. I've made a boatload of mistakes, still making them. Uh, and, uh, you know, above all, I'm an all pro dad. Hmm. So. I love it. <clears throat> yeah. 
Well, about 60% of our audience is still on active duty. So I always like to start with rewinding the clock back to the 90s when you yeah. left the army and just what you would want listeners to know about what that experience was like for you, what that job search was like for you and any lessons learned that you'd like to pass on. Well, you know, Justin, if we were going to rewind that far back, I think the first thing I'm going to be forthright about is my frontal lobe was far from fully developed. Uh, man, I had so much growing uh, to do, like like we all still do, right? But, uh, you know, it was a different time when I was in the military, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, we were in that, that tweener stage between a lot of the conflict that we've experienced since then. And you know, my, my mission was very straightforward. You know, I had a very modest upbringing, you could say, prior to joining the Army. So the Army was what I very proudly call my first step in my climb towards my ticket to opportunity. And it said another way, is like, that was my first step in trying to take control of my story. And my mission was set very clear on beginning my education right after the army so that I could then pursue a very uh, strong entrepreneurial itch that I had inside. Uh, I didn't know what that was going to be, mm. but I knew that it was in there. Mm. I, I love that. And I love the story of, of opportunity. And I love, uh, you know, throughout your book and, and your personal story, like you, I do get this sense of this um, determination and strong will. It seems like some of that comes from your father, but this determination to leave your kids better than yourself and to leave the world better than yourself and to leave that your employees better than, than they were before. Like, I love this thought of, of growth and momentum that seems to characterize your story. Well, I, one, I appreciate that. And two, um, yeah, I believe we all share that. You know, I'll often, when I do storytelling, when I speak to, you know, kids born on the wrong side of the opportunity divide like myself or veterans and veteran entrepreneurs, I love doing storytelling for most in particular, those two audiences. And, uh, you know, I'll often use them out in metaphor hmm. because, I believe that we're all climbing our own mountain. Like there's a place that we imagine that looks and feels better than where we are today. And there's no doubt, like you experience that probably when you see the beautiful mountains there in Denver. Yeah. You know, there's something about the mountain that at least for me, it has this pool to it and yeah, we all want to climb hmm. and uh, we all have our different reasons for wanting to climb. We're all climbing our own mountain. I talk about that in the book and really having that perspective and respecting that in others. And, uh, but I do appreciate you recognizing that, but I, I believe that's something we all share. Hmm. Let's, let's maybe, um, we're going to, we're going to rewind a little bit, but let's start with the foundation. I gave a forward description of your company. Let's, uh -huh. I'd love for you to share with our listeners, Populous Group, like what, what it is and, and how they might understand what you're doing. Yeah. So uh, I want to do it in order, if I may. Yeah. So uh, when I say in order, um, if you don't, with your permission, I'd like to tell you why I did it. Mm. And then I'll, uh, after that, you know, why don't I tell you the problem we solve for the world? This yeah. I love that too. We, right? so. Yeah. We had Simon Sinek's right-hand man, Peter Docker on the show, maybe, I don't know, nine months ago. And I love the, yeah. the whole premise of starting with why. So I love yeah. your story starting with that. Yeah. Well, I started the book with this story. It's a marker story for me. It's the bus story. And you know, just when I was 17, my brother and I, we were on a return trip home from a basketball game. Mm -hmm. And along the way we stopped for dinner. And everyone unloaded off the bus, except for me and my brother, Ed. You know, at that point in our family story, we didn't have the means to play sports and afford dinner. And we were well beyond the embarrassment. You know, we knew our family was doing the best they could. And a few moments after the team unloaded, one of the dads of the other players steps on board the bus. And he razzed me a little bit because Ed had outscored me at night, no, to no one's surprise. He was a much better basketball player than I was. And, you know, then he said something to me that I will always remember. 
Bobby, it would make me very happy if you would allow me to buy you boys dinner so that you can join the rest of the team. Nobody else has to know. All you have to do to thank me is do the same thing for another great kid in the future. And to this day, it's hard for me to explain that overwhelming sense of gratitude that I had at that moment. And I remember stepping off the bus at night and I'm 17. I can't see three feet in front of my face. I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. All I knew is that I wanted my future to look much different than my past. Outside of knowing that, hey, I think I want to raise my hand and join the army a year later, uh, the best, best branch, by the way, mm -hmm. I, uh, <laughs> uh, I was clueless. But after that moment, I knew why. Like I would somehow, some way, figure out a way to create something that would allow me to pay forward that kind act to other kids like me who were born on the wrong side of the opportunity divide. Mm. And that act of kindness, you know, it's packed with lessons, but from an entrepreneurial perspective, that's where it started for me. It's like that became the invisible force that drove me. And I had no idea what it was going to be, but I knew that nothing could stop me. And I was going to figure out a way to create something that would eventually become my vehicle to do just that. Mm. And so that's, that's why I, I did it. And, you know, as I tell my story and the journey in the gift of struggle, you know, I eventually get to that, you know, marker date of 2002 where I did it. But uh, I think it's most important to start with that invisible force that was driving me because uh, I think that's something that we often, we downplay the energy and the force of something like that when we talk about entrepreneurial stories and companies and so forth. What I appreciated about that, I'm glad you brought that story up. I was going to bring that up as well. Um, there's a thread that I see in your book of this um, <clears throat> humility, both in your willingness to share mistakes and what you learn from them, but also the recognition of the small, seemingly small acts of kindness from others and their generosity that had an outsized impact on your own life. Like in, I just think if I like bought some kid dinner, it's nothing for me, like 20 bucks, whatever. It's absolutely nothing. But taking that initiative and doing that, that might not be something that this man even remembers, but it had such an incredible impact on your life and your approach to business. And I think that's a great reminder for all of us of these tiny acts of kindness that can have a life changing impact on someone else. And I also think it's great for, I know many of our listeners aspire to start their own company, mm -hmm. the leverage. If you take someone who is, I want to start a company to get rich, which seems like the prevailing thought these days, or to be significant and gain fame. But if you take this, which is you want to have a vehicle to have a bigger impact on others, I'll bet on that person any day of the week, there's so much more leverage behind that and drive to succeed because it's not about you. It's about something bigger than yourself. Yeah, I mean, undoubtedly. I mean, that's, that's one of the driving reasons, whether intentional or intuitive, that many of us raise our hand to serve. Like we want to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. And there's that embedded desire in many of us. Um, now, you know, I want to asterisk one thing. Uh, you talked about buying that kid dinner and maybe not knowing. Let's book in the story I just told at the end with what happened later uh, at the at the end of our recording here, let's 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 yeah. let's make sure we asterisk that. But yep. uh, you, know, you said something that I think is you know profoundly important. I um, yeah, you know, I'd like to think that I would have figured it out on my own, Justin. And you talk about humility, uh, but that's not a that's that's not a real comfortable thought for me. You know, I I have many of occasions wondered whether or not I would have somehow connected to a bigger meaning had that gentleman not stepped on board the bus. His name was Harry Teague. Well, you know, humility is a secret of the wise. Mm -hmm. And like, I often imagine what if he would have extended that invitation another way? You know, it's very possible that my pride could have overwhelmed that moment. And I'd, I would have made the wrong choice and not exercised 
what really what strength really is and accepted the help right mm. but he had the wisdom and the humility to ask me to do it to someone else but that moment also uh, there's a backstory he was a very successful businessman in the community mm. and the narrative that i told myself at that time was that hey people like harry they don't see kids like me but with one small act of kindness not only did he teach me that i was wrong but he taught me that one of the single most important parts of leadership is seeing and encouraging potential. Mm. And I've never forgotten that lesson. Mm -hmm. And there's not a member in the armed forces that's either active or a veteran that doesn't carry that core value of seeing others and putting others first above all. So our wonderful, brave, courageous men and women that are serving and have served, man, they have such an extraordinary leg up per se. Mm -hmm. Just knowing that it's like, there's not a entrepreneur or business owner in America that doesn't want to have people like that as part of their organization. Mm. So we need to lean into that. Mm. We, we have what we need. I so. love that. I, <clears throat> it makes me think of when I was at the Naval Academy, we took a trip to the um, to a jet scheme. And it was like, I, I don't know what the gentleman's role was, but he was a Naval Academy grad who was very senior in, in the jet stadium. And I remember we were walking around with him and he saw like one of the, just, you know, one of the workers and he was like, Hey, he knew the guy's name. He's like, Hey man, did you get that walkie talkie you needed? Okay. I got you. And I just remember it was like the perfect reinforcement of what I was learning academically, which was like, look out for your people, like look out yeah. for them, know them, know what they need, see them, see what their value is. It was, um, it, that comes through in what you're saying as well, that seeing potential in people and, and doing what you can to support them. Yeah. I mean, psychologically next to food, shelter and water, being seen is one of our biggest psychological needs as a human animal. And, you know, people often ask me, Hey, why'd that moment have such a profound impact on you, Bobby? Was, you know, aside from some of those dynamics I shared, it was the first time in my life that I felt seen mm. and the impact it had on me is, uh, it just became the invisible force that drove me. Like, mm. you know, as, Every, every one of those moments where I wanted to quit, and there were many, that desire to pay forward that kind act was greater than the pain that I was feeling from whatever struggle I was going through. Mm. I'm very open about some of those. You know, I was getting, I was getting my kicked with steel toed boots at times. <laughs> Well, take us to, to 2002. So you've got at this early age, you've got this why defined and something happens in 2002 that leads to this um, epic lifetime undertaking of yours. What, what happened that brought about, uh, that brought about Populous Group? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, well, then we can kind of get into the what, what we do for the world and the problem we solve. I had been part of a wonderful organization that uh, I still have an extraordinary relationship with. And I accidentally got into the recruiting industry in the mid nineties. Like most people, we get into our, you know, the mountain we climb and the problem we solve for the world accidentally. And you know, I had been with them for quite some time and moved countless times, got in at a very early age, learned the recruiting industry inside and out through their generous extension of trust, put me in many roles that quite frankly, I wasn't ready for. Mm. And you know, after I'd been with them about almost a decade, I was starting to notice the industry changing. And a lot of the customers that we were working with, they were saying, Hey, look, you're identifying and recruiting great talent for us. However, the talent landscape's changing and there's all these peripheral, you know, sources of talent that we need above and beyond just recruiting talent. Can you help me? And we were a very disciplined organization at the time we were staying in our lane. We're like, you know, we're going to politely decline. This is what we're good at. And I, I, I admired that, but I, my light bulb started slowly going from 40 to 60 to 80 to hundred Watts. And I started those conversations and say, well, look, 
if we're saying no to this and this problem's annoying the heck out of them, what if I figure out a way to do it? And through a series of those conversations over the years, I just kept at it and kept revisiting and you know, corny metaphor that I use is like, Hey, their bologna could be my filet. Mm. And I'm like, they're just throwing it away. And I finally, you know, six months after I got married, uh, in, you know, I got married in 2001 in 2002, it was one of those like, Hey, regrets are wasting emotion. Mm. I either take that leap now or forever look back and dwell on the fact that I didn't have the courage to take the leap. And I had a wonderful supportive wife and, you know, you know, populist group, I actually named it. Populous is Latin for people. Mm. And we help organizations better manage their non-permanent workforce. Do you think, especially given how many aspiring entrepreneurs there are listening to this episode, do you, do you think you could have started Populous Group directly out of the military? Like obviously the idea came from the work that you were doing, but I'm just curious about your thoughts around <clears throat> starting something sooner versus gaining experience and starting something later. If you have any advice around that. Um, you know, I think that's a, I think that's an and question versus an or question, Justin. Um, like me personally, I, um, I wasn't ready. And uh, I, in my specific journey, like I feel like I personally still had too many lessons to learn. I had to get a lot of the fundamental educational components. But I think even more than that, although I had the why define, I hadn't, I had yet to identify like where I could very intentionally apply my gifts, my strengths. And so, you know, my journey, and, and I think that's where, you know, often when we're starting our careers or our journey, you know, I often say we take the wrong trail, mm. right? So we're looking for answers like, oh, you know, we're trying to figure out what should I do? What should I do? Well, let's flip the narrative. Take a different trail. I, the questions, that, uh, the key to entrepreneurship is asking bigger questions. And I wouldn't, if I had to go back, which I wouldn't change a thing, but if, if you know, someone that's in that stage now, perhaps the question I would consider asking is, hey, where can I make my most significant contribution to the world? Mm. And if you already have the answer to that, hey, take the loop, take the leap. Like, hey, all hell, the underdog, go nuts. And it's going to suck. It's going to be brutal. Now, I often say the first five years, the most fun I never want to have again. But you know what? You won't regret a thing, <clears throat> right? So um, I didn't have enough insight and clarity to where I believed I could make my most significant contribution and apply my strengths because I hadn't fully developed them yet. Mm -hmm. Some other people coming out of the military, they, they may have that now. So I would instead encourage, instead of figuring out, hey, when, I don't know, you define, do you have enough clarity to get, get you started with asking yourself that question? I love that. I love the... Um honesty that entails of understanding like is this you know is this my unique gift to give to the world is this where i can have the biggest impact and i'm i'm guessing for you at least from from the book it seems like part of the impact is the the <clears throat> effect you have on the you know 9000 or so workers that are around the world helping you like you're making their life better but you're also, and you're making companies' lives better that work with them. But it seems like a big driving force too is those 300 internal employees, like the impact you have on their life on a day to day basis and on their well being. Yeah. Uh, well, you, you sparked something that I want to unpack a little bit, Justin, mm -hmm. because in, uh, in the book, I talk about my dear mentor, Dr. Joe. And you know, Dr. Joe, man, he's, he's taught me so much. And earlier I said, I got into the industry by accident. Well, my dear mentor, dear Dr. Joe says, Hey Bobby, there are no accidents. Mm. Well, my father, and I talk about my dad and my family's journey in the book. He was actually a temporary worker, a bracero from Mexico. Well, you know, there's an interesting thread now that my father was a temporary, you know, 
contract worker from Mexico in the 50s and 60s. And now I'm serving a population of contingent workers across various, very fortunately, Fortune 100 organizations across uh, across the U.S. And um, so my lens and my community, I'm so grateful. Uh, and I, I call my company a community because we're part of something bigger than ourselves, bringing that bus story life. That's how we see our contractor community. Like we see that temporary worker who is like my father, who's simply trying to advance their family story and mm-hmm. figure out a way to help their family create a better story. Mm-hmm. That's all my father was trying to do for me. And that's what all these great people are trying to do for themselves. So we don't take that lightly. And it's that common thread. And I tell that story often. I actually just told that story at our annual Climber Summit, you know, where we start off our year with half my organization. And, mm. um, you know, I felt it was a, 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 an important point to make specifically because as we're answering, hey, where can I make my biggest contribution? Like, sometimes we're in a rush. It's like, what's the hurry? Mm. Like, you have the rest of your life to make a bunch of mistakes. Now, we don't know when tomorrow is going to be our final tomorrow per se. But that aside, like, get the clarity you need and figure out what you're really good at. Take some risk and you know, put yourself in all these situations to just be curious as heck. Mm. I was just very fortunate that I was able to do that. And, and it sounds like that, that connection, maybe it was happening on a subconscious level, but the connection to your father, it's almost like you realize that in hindsight of seeing, it wasn't like that was this um, conscious thought that you were seeking to do that, but it was almost in the rear view mirror that you realize like, oh man, this is like a fundamental part of my story. Yeah, it definitely was a, a dot that was connected versus a target that I aimed at. Like, mm. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't smart enough to, to <laughs> aim speci- precisely that, that intentionally. It, uh, again, I'm just so grateful that now those dots have been connected. It's a thread that I'm very proud of. And, you know, we, uh, we get to choose more than we often give ourselves, mm. you know, credit in thinking that we can. Mm. I, I want to talk about your entrepreneurial journey, but I think one component that, that rings for me is, is the title of your book, The Gift of Struggle. And I'd love to give you space to talk about mm-hmm. where that idea even comes from or what that means, and then also what you'd want listeners to know about your book. Yeah. I, um, you know, it's a bit of a brain warp, right? Uh, you know, often, you know, as we evolve in life, we're, I think, well-intended with trying to conceal our struggle. We're not open about discussing what they are and, you know, the, the origin of it and the emphasis of it was really around my leadership philosophy that I developed over the years, you know, starting from that experience on the bus, my family story and other experiences that I talk very openly about in the book, but you know, my leadership philosophy is very simple. And that is we all struggle. Every struggle teaches us something. That's the gift. And leadership is sharing those gifts with others. And, you know, I went through a stage in my leadership climb per se, where, you know, I saw the alpha myths and the dogmas of leadership like very blatantly and I, it just never sit, sat well with me. You know, I had very good people doing their best guiding me and I was very fortunate that I've worked for some great people over the years. However, uh, they, when I say they hadn't figured out that vulnerability was a co- key competency of leadership, That's a massive understatement. And what's interesting about that is like, we all know when someone doesn't have their stuff together, yet that person that's trying to conceal it is so overt 
about trying to act like they don't have any, you know, kinks in their armor per se. Um, and that just never sat well with me. And, you know, I've never been one to follow rules any more than I had to. And I was like, you know what? I, uh, it, it, I'm going to do, I'm going to do it, try to do my best to do it differently. Mm. So that's the origin around my philosophy. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> Uh, I had an experience three weeks in the boot camp that I'd like to share that I call the flap of the butterfly wings. Um, you know, it was late at night, about three weeks in to boot camp in the army. And I remember Justin, it was about 1130 at night and we were, you know, polishing our boots by flashlight. I know that's odd for you to hear because the Navy doesn't know anything about that. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I, re I specifically remember all around me, the soldiers that were in my platoon at the time, I mean, they were complaining about the night that had no end in sight and the morning that was going to start way too soon. You know, we were right in the heart of that mental haze. And I remember specifically thinking, I've been getting up at five in the morning since I was yay high. I know what it's like not to have any material comfort. I know what it's like to have very little free time from all the years of working in the fields. And I remember thinking, I got this. Like there's nothing that they could say and do to me that I haven't somehow experienced in some cases in a harsher manner. I mean, it, I had been asked to leave the table because of the color of my skin and the language I spoke. And that was the flap of the butterfly wings. And I remember thinking, maybe all that struggle I went to went through was part of the plan. And it just started changing my view on my story and everything that I'd experienced. And, you know, from that moment forward is when I started looking at some of these struggles that I had and these hardships. And, you know, I'm a storyteller and I've always built those kind of stories and lessons into my, my talks and so forth. And, uh, but that right there was the flap of the butterfly wings mm -hmm. three weeks in the basic training when I noticed all around me that others viewed their struggles differently. And I just started shifting my mindset around it. I, I love, I love that. I, I just love the, uh, purpose and autonomy that gives to someone when they adopt that mindset that like this struggle, even if I'm in it, this struggle has a purpose. This is training. This is the weights. I'm lifting weights. I'm doing reps. I'm getting stronger. The suffering is not happening to me. It's happening for me. It's happening for my, my own growth. And <clears throat> one of the things I love about this whole premise of the gift of struggle, um, when, you know, I went from submarines to business school, started a company, raised a lot of money, grew a company to 20 people, shrunk it to three, grew it to 15, just kind of went through the ringer, okay. that, that five years that you were talking about. And around that five year point, I, I was pretty close to giving up and I had beers with a more seasoned entrepreneur. And I went through my complaining about all the struggle I was experiencing. And his reaction was like, and what's your point? That, that's, that's the way this is. This, this whole thing is never ending struggle. And I think um, the reason that was so powerful for me is I had bought into this Instagram idea of success, that it is instantaneous, that it's overnight, that it's struggle free. And I think that's a disservice we do that to the entrepreneurial community is painting this picture of overnight success rather than the true, the truth, which you talk about in your book is like the constant setbacks, the constant struggles, yeah. the constant wounds that make you stronger, that, that help you find your way rather than this, this freeway that's paved and problem free that can be so discouraging if that's your, your expectation for the journey. Uh, amen. Mm. I, you know, I, um, I'll often encourage people that haven't, you know, yet gotten to the place in their life to really embrace struggle as a source of empowerment. And that's okay. We all get there at different stages of our life, but I'll often encourage leaders that I work with, you know, I'll give them a blank sheet of paper and I'll say, Hey, let's go back to the beginning. And on the left side, 
I want you to go back to marker events in your life and write down the specific struggle. And, and then after you do that, I want you to draw a line through the middle of the page. And on the other side, I want you to write down what it taught you. And it's a very therapeutic exercise because after some in-depth conversation around that experience, they will quickly come to the realization that, oh my gosh, had I not gone through that, I may not have figured out how to be a compassionate father. I may have not figured out how to do X or Y. And the more we do that, which requires courage, by the way, to do a deep excavation like that, it requires courage, it requires rigor, it requires discipline, which every veteran and current member of the armed forces knows a thing or two about. Those are the skills that you need to apply to better answer the single most important question in your leadership or entrepreneurial journey, which is, you know, who am I? Which is the first part of the book. Yeah. You have to be able to answer who am I before you can do anything else because it's all contingent on that. Your struggles will give you the key to that. I love that. What, what advice do you have for people who aspire to start a company? I know it's a, a very general question, but I'm just aware of your nearly 20 years of experience in the trenches and having built such an um, incredible organization and then also being aware of the unbelievable ups and downs that must have led to this point. I'm curious what advice you would have um, for people who want to go on a similar journey of their own. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was on a podcast yesterday, Justin, and someone asked me, Hey, if you could go back and have, have a drink with your 20 year old self or whatever, I said, what would you do? I said, well, first and foremost, I would buy myself probably the best uh, custom brew. <laughs> sold. Yep. And my younger self, I'd buy them the cheapest beer <laughs> they had because he didn't deserve anything more. <laughs> and then I would raise my glass and I'd say, Hey, here's to your climb. I wouldn't say or change a thing to that younger self. Mm. I would say, Hey, I'm going to have a lot of fun watching you struggle, watching you fall on your face. Mm-hmm. But Hey, fall down seven times, get up eight brother. And I would toast and, and, uh, I just give him a big grin and that'd be like, mm. you got any questions? Uh, there's a reason for that rant. And that is, um, I, uh, uh, one of my, one of my friends, his name's Michael, uh, Bungay Stainer. He actually, he, he's coming out with a book actually this weekend called the advice trap that I highly recommend. I got a sneak preview of it. Um, but it's a great leadership book. Anyway, um, Michael has a term that I'm going to borrow. He's like, yeah, don't be an advice monster. So I'm not going to be an advice monster. But what I would consider, questions that I know I was asking myself at that stage were very simple. Who am I and what do I want? And I often find that when I ask someone those two questions, they struggle mightily. And because it, 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 when, when we don't have the clarity to those, who am I and what do I want, it's like, What's advice going to do for you? You know, start there, look in, find the things that give you energy, identify what your biggest contributions are, your strengths, your gifts. And, you know, if there's things that, that people are telling you to work on and you suck at those things, just politely stop listening to those people. Mm -hmm. God made you bad at those things for a reason. He made someone else good at those. So, you know, again, I would, I would, I would encourage uh, your listeners to, Hey, instead of going to the answer trail, why don't you go down this one? The long way is the shortcut, which I say in the book Mm -hmm. and questions will get you there. What what about, you know, something that comes up for me as, as we're talking about struggle is um, I'm I'm wondering about your thoughts on, on quitting because, Uh you know, on the one hand, I see a story of you encountering so much struggle. And like you said, being knocked down seven times and getting up eight times. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on the discernment between 
when, when to take some of that feedback and realize like, Hey, I, I actually need to go around this wall instead of through it, or maybe yeah. this isn't right for me, or maybe it's time for me to shut down this company or to leave this job mm -hmm. versus also the wisdom of knowing when it's temporary setbacks and it's something to over overcome rather than to, to yeah. quit. Yeah. Well, another great question, Justin, because you know, quitting to me fits in the same genre of the, le of the word no. And often we think those two words are a four letter word. They're not. They're a great word and you need that. You need those two in your vernacular to climb whatever mountain you're climbing. So what I've found to be more successful in anything is I'm so blessed. I've surrounded myself with a community of people and a great team that I tell them very early on from the beginning, one of your biggest responsibilities is to tell me when I'm wrong mm. and to tell me no. And if you're starting your entrepreneurial journey and you're not surrounded with yourself with those people, then, okay, that's going to, that's going to put you in a situation to where you don't realize that quitting isn't a four letter word. Mm -hmm. And, Oh, I've absolutely quit on some things. And the questions that I've asked myself is, Hey, yeah, is continuing more my ego or am I uh, continuing to serve my community? And, you know, that's where those trails kind of help me understand. It's like, hey, if people are getting hurt as a result of my thick-headed stubbornness here, it's like quitting's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, do you understand the essence of what I'm sharing? Yeah, I love not that sense. Word. <clears throat> yeah, I love the sense, too, of it comes back to your why. It comes back, the same advice you gave around timing on, you know, it could be starting a company, it could just easily be. Yeah starting a different job mm -hmm. but that sense of is 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 the world better served by me doing this right now is this is this yeah. the impact i'm to have on the world it mm -hmm. sounds similar which is like man is it's interesting too that could even be applied to relationships and family structures and things like mm -hmm. that is like um <clears throat> am i quitting this because it's difficult and i want the discomfort to end <clears throat> am i quitting this because this thing is played out and I'm no longer serving the mm -hmm. world, my community, my purpose by doing it. There's a lot of wisdom there of asking that simple question that I imagine is very difficult to answer is parsing through the, the motivation to, to tap out. And sometimes that's the right call and sometimes it's not. And it's, it's a good question to throw in the mix. And it requires uh, varying perspectives. You know, we all, process information differently and surrounding yourself with people that see the world differently, however, still have similar values and beliefs is critical to that dialogue mm -hmm. because often, you know, well, well intentioned, we just, you know, tend to read the bottle from in, you know, read the label from inside the bottle. Mm -hmm. It's easy to get in those stubborn tendencies uh, I, I've been there mm. and you know, it just proves you're human. That's all it does. I, uh, you know, Justin, I also think that it's important to zoom out and always consider whether or not, you know, you continuing on a journey where you're <clears throat> contemplating, Hey, should I quit or should I not quit? You know, does it align with that? final mark or that final box that we want to check. And, you know, this I think is where I want to asterisk that first, you know, story that I told, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, um, uh, I went many, many years before I called that, that gentleman on the bus, Harry, and told him the impact that that kind act had had on me. You know, it was, it was just a few years ago and, you know, it was a summer day. I picked up the phone and I called him. I got his number and I told him the bus story and I told him the impact it had on me. And I told him, you know, the journey of what I had tried to do to pay for that kind of act and things that I've done and very fortunate uh, ways that I've been able to pay that forward. And it was a real special moment for us. Well, 
a three, uh, about three days later, I get a note from Harry. And in that note, he says to me, you know, Bobby, thank you for calling me and telling me the bus story. I don't mind sharing the many tears that I shed during and after that call. You made me feel like my life had mattered. And that is the ultimate box. Like I believe in the end, every single one of us want to be able to say, did my life matter? And I think it takes us a while to get to that point to where whatever we're pursuing, is it advancing our ability to check that box? Because like, if it's just about being right, that's ego. Like there's no ROE in life, return on ego. If it's about checking that box, fight like hell. Go through the wall, around the wall, jump it, blow it up, dig a tunnel underneath, do whatever you need to do if it's going to help you check that box. If it's not, get over yourself. Right? And surround yourself with people that you know, grab you and say, hey, dude, let's go drink a beer because your skull has expanded about three layers. You're, you're killing us. So, I love the two things I want to point out. First of all, I love... Um, I love the full, full circle of Harry being this person in your life who sees you, sees, you know, sees you and you feel seen and, and heard by him. And I love this flipping, you know, decades later where you are seeing Harry, like he's feeling seen by you for the contribution yeah. his life has had on you and, and thousands of others because of that one act. Yeah. And I also love this thread in your story too of surrounding yourself with people who I like, I like the way you said that who have shared values, but different perspectives and people who can call out blind spots and people who can challenge you when you're going in the wrong direction and people who can tell, you no know, and set boundaries. I think there is so much power in that for listeners, regardless of their intended career path. To, uh, a friend of mine calls it his informal board of advisors, and it's someone to, to, to bounce ideas off of. And I do a lot of work with men's groups. And on one of them recently, the guy leading it was like, hey, this, this, this gentleman, Jonah, is going through a lot right now. How many people would trust him to make decisions about his business right now? And no one raised their hand. Like, How many people would trust him to make decisions about his relationship? And no one raised their hands. And that was his call of like, look, man, you're in a you're in the crucible right now. Let's not make any major life decisions. And it's hard to imagine doing that in, in isolation of doing that alone. And so I love your story of surrounding yourself for the journey with people who are going to complement your own decision making. Can I share a real simple yeah. checklist to, you know, cause sometimes the question is, well, Hey, how do I identify those people? It's like, don't overcomplicate it. Surround yourself with people that will always tell you you have a booger in your nose mm. and you have bad breath. We've all had <laughs> boogers. We've all had bad breath. Yeah. If you don't have those kind of people around you and they won't tell you those two things, they're not going to tell you about the big problems. Mm, I love that. It's, it's simple. Well, it's simple. For, easy. for listeners, you know, you're just getting a taste. There's so much we could go into here, but I'll put a link to, to Bobby's book, The Gift of Struggle, in the show notes at beyondtheuniform.org. I wanted to ask you as well, and I'll also add a link to the advice trap from your, your friend, which comes out this weekend. Um, I wanted to ask any other re resources you would recommend to listeners. That could be books or podcasts or web, uh, webinars or mm -hmm. conferences, anything that, that has helped you that they might want to check out. Yeah. Um, I actually, uh, I dedicated a chapter around that in the book, you know, always be a student where I share my relationship with Dr. Joe. Um, so I think I would, you know, I, I would, I would recommend that listeners consider studying that chapter and being a student the way that I outline it. Um, again, I'm going to try to do my best to be consistent here, Justin. I would always start with a question and that is, Hey, what I'm a less, but better kind of guy. And that is, Hey, what do I fundamentally want to get really good at right now that will help me climb my mountain and pick that one thing. And I would also encourage them to consider two things. Is this one of my gifts to the world? Right? Because if it's not, don't waste your time. And two, then ask yourself, who is the absolute best at this? 
and study that person like you've never studied anything before. Mm. That's what I did. Mm. Um, and that's what I continue to do. And I talk about my Bible row in the book, you know, uh, repetitions of mother skill. I'm a rereader. I'm a reapplier. And like, you know, that's how we learn those corny lyrics, right? Re repetition, 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 right? Do it again, do it again, do it again, do it again. So. And, and I love that too. If, if you could just give the one minute version you talk about in your book, this really, I mean, I read this thing four, four months ago or so, but it stuck with me is this sense of um, the way that you read books. It's not, you read the book and you put it down. Could you yeah. just share a little bit about how you approach reading a book? Yeah. Um, so it starts with those questions that I just shared. And then I'll pick a book from someone who I believe is the best at what I'm intending to learn. And I, it's a, it's a three part series. The first part is I read it front to back, right? I block time. I'll read it at my own pace. I'm a morning person. So I'll read in the mornings and, um, uh, yeah, slow is fast. Uh, like my fellow Navy men say, mm -hmm. and, uh, I would, I'll, I'll do that. I won't, I'll resist the urge to highlight, to write notes or anything the first time I read it. And then I'll set it down, let it digest. And then I'll go back and that's when I bring out my highlighter or my, and my pen and I'll read it again and I'll highlight the areas of the book that really popped for me that I believe will amplify my strengths. And I write a note next to it on how I'm going to apply what I learned because reading it, I call it the 1% applications and 99%. That's mm -hmm. where the magic happens. So that's steps one and two. And then the third part is what I just shared. Repetition is like, I, I reread it. You know, I'll pull it off the shelf maybe once a quarter, scan those highlight notes and I'll ask how well am I applying what I said? You know, how well am I doing what I said I was going to do? Mm. And then over time, you know, the beauty of compound application slash interest, you know, kicks in and mm. that's a, you, but you have to go through that struggle, pain, and suffering to get to that wisdom that you desire. It's not pretty at first, trust me. <laughs> well, I love, I love, Bobby, your example of mastery, of going deep and, and building true depth rather than just floating on the surface and doing a lot poorly. And mm -hmm. I love your openness, both on the, the interview today as well as in the book, The Gift of Struggle, around the setbacks, the challenges, the mistakes that have made you who you are and have made your company what it is. So thank you for sharing your story today and for, for taking the time to speak with me and be on the uniform. Hey, I'm grateful. You're given to a lot of great people, Justin, and I'm grateful to serve your mission and keep giving more than you take. And like I said earlier, all hell the underdog. Service, service, service. Beyond the Uniform is written and produced by me, Justin Nasiri, with help from our Chief of Staff, Steve Bain, and our editor, Kathleen Dillon. We are an all-volunteer organization and would greatly appreciate your help in any of the following ways. First, spread the word. Beyond the Uniform has over 330 podcast episodes and 15 on-demand webinars, all offered for free. Help us spread the word on social media, at military bases, or whatever gets this resource in front of more men and women who need it. Positive reviews on iTunes go a long way towards this as well. Second, sponsorship. Beyond the Uniform relies on sponsorship to keep us going. There is so much more we'd like to do, but we don't have nearly the resources to do so. If you know of a company that would like to advertise in any way with Beyond the Uniform, please send them to beyondtheuniform.org. Third, donations. If you're in a financial position to donate, you can find more information on the support section of beyondtheuniform.org. At our website, beyondtheuniform.org, you'll also find 330-plus episodes categorized by industry, functional role, and more. You'll find a link for live events, typically four per month. You'll also find both free and for-purchase books that take a deeper dive on topics related to career growth. Thank you for your support as we aim to help members of the military and their families thrive in their post-military career and life.